Good morning, boys and girls. Here we are, ready to read the fourth chapter of The Wind in the Willows. It's called The Wild Wood. Before we do, I want to, to see if you remember some of the literary tools that we've been talking about. Um, remember, we've been talking about dialogue and narration, and I'm hoping that those terms are really clear for you right now. By the time we get to the end of The Wind in the Willows, you will need to be able to write about narration and dialogue, what the similarities are, what the differences are. When you talk about the similarities and differences of something, you're talking about comparing them and contrasting them. All of these are terms that should be becoming really familiar to you. And also, you should be able to participate in a conversation about comparing, contrasting, dialogue, narration. We've also been talking a lot about perspective. And remember, perspective is that literary tool that lets a reader know from whose experience we are learning more about the story. Whose experience is helping us guide, be guided through this story. So perspective, just like dialogue, can shift from one character to another. You're also going to be seeing more about the changing of the setting in this story. The setting of a story is where and when a story takes place. Say that with me. The setting is where and when a story takes place. So you're going to see the setting change in this story. So far we've had spring, we've had summer activities in this story, and you can guess what might come next. I am showing you a picture from the very first lesson. And this is when Rat had first taken Mole out onto a boat and Mole was just learning about the river. I'm gonna read this one little slide because this is going to help us know where we're ending up in, this, in chapter four. But it says, what lies over there? Asked the Mole, waving a paw toward the background of woodland that darkly framed the water meadows on one side of the river. Well, replied the rat hesitantly, that's the wild wood. We don't go there too often. Are there scary creatures there? The Mole asked, trying not to tremble. The squirrels are all right, Rat replied, and the rabbits, some of them, but rabbits are a mixed lot. And then there's Badger, of course. He lives right in the heart of it. Wouldn't live anywhere else either. Dear old Badger, nobody interferes with him. Why? Who should interfere with him? Asked the mole. Well, of course, there are others. Picked the rat in a hesitating sort of way. Foxes and so on. They're all right in the way. I'm very good friends with some of them. Past the time of day when we meet. But you can't. Trust them, and that's a fact. That's the background for as we move into chapter four. The mole had long wanted to meet the badger, but the water rat always had a reason to postpone the occasion. Badger will turn up someday or not, or another, the rat would say. Couldn't you ask him to dinner? Asked the mole. He wouldn't come, replied the rat simply. Well, then supposing we go and call on him, suggested the mole. Oh, he wouldn't like that at all, said the rat, quite alarmed. Besides, he lives in the middle of the wild wood. Well, supposing he does like it, said the mole. You told me the wild wood was all right. I know, so it is, replied the rat evasively, but he wouldn't be at home at this time of year anyhow. The mole had to be content with this. Summer had left, taking the warmth and sweet fragrances with it. The autumn and winter days brought cold winds and glistening frost. No one thought about boating, and so the time, with time to ponder, the mole began to think once more of badger. In the winter time, the rat slept a great deal. He retired early and rose late. Consequently, the mole had plenty of spare time on his hands. One afternoon, while the rat rested in his armchair before the fire, mole decided he would explore the wild woods and perhaps meet Mr. Badger. 
Uh oh, do you think that's a good idea? It was a cold, still afternoon when he slipped out of the warm parlor. Hmm, look at that change of setting. <coughs> the country lay bare and leafless around him. The mole liked the country like this, stripped of its finery, and so with great cheerfulness of spirit, he pushed on toward the wild wood. There was nothing to alarm him at first, and then as his journey progressed, he moved into a shadowy world in which trees crouched nearer, and the holes in various tree trunks gaped like hideous mouths. The dusk descended steadily. Then the faces began. It was over his shoulder that he first thought he saw a face, and when he turned and confronted it, the thing had vanished. He quickened his pace. He passed another hole and a little narrow face flashed up. If he could only get away from the holes, he thought, there would be no more faces. He swung off the path and plunged into the untrodden places of the wood. Then the whistling began. Very faint it was when first he heard it, but somehow it made him hurry forward. Then the pattering began. He thought it was only falling leaves at first and then it grew as it grew, he knew it was the pat, pat, pat of little feet. The mole began to run. He ran up against things. He fell over things. And at last he took refuge in the hollow of an old beech tree. Terrified and exhausted, the mole lay there, trembling. Meanwhile, hmm, that's a transition. The rat, warm and comfortable, dozed by his fireside. It was not until a coal in the fire slipped and set up a spurt of flames that he awoke. He immediately looked around for his companion, but the mole was not there. He listened for a time. The house seemed very quiet. Then he called, Molly, several times, and received no answer, got up and went out into the hall. The mole's cap was missing from its peg. His Wellington boots were also gone. The rat left the house and found the mole's tracks leading straight to the wild wood. The rat stood there in deep in thought. He then re-entered the house, strapped a belt around his waist and shoved his brace of pistols into it. Finally, he picked up a stout cudgel and set off for the wild woods. It was already getting toward dusk when he reached the wood, and as he moved among the trees, the rat looked about for his friend. Here and there, wicked little faces popped out of holes that vanished immediately at the sight of such a well-armed creature. Pistols, cudgel. The rat called out to his friend for an hour or more, when at last he heard a little answering cry. Guided by the sound, he made his way to an old beech tree with a hole in it. From out of the hole came a feeble voice saying, Ratty, is it really you? The rat crept into the hole, and there he found the mole. Oh, Ratty, cried, I've been so frightened. Oh, I quite understand, said the rat soothingly. We river bankers hardly ever come here by ourselves. Surely the brave Mr. Toad wouldn't mind coming here by himself, would he? inquired the mole. Old Toad, said the rat, laughing heartily, he wouldn't show his face along here for anything. The mole was greatly cheered by the sound of rat's laughter. Now then, said the rat, we really must make a start for home. Dear ratty, said the poor mole, you must let me rest a while longer. All right, said the rat, it's nearly pitch dark now, and there ought to be a bit of a moon later. So the mole snuggled down and went to sleep while the rat lay patiently waiting with a pistol in his paw. When at last the mole woke up, the rat said, now then, I'll just take a look outside and see if everything's quiet and then we really must be off. He went to the entrance and put his head out. What's up, ratty? asked the mole. Snow is up, replied the rat briefly, or rather down. The mole came and crouched beside him and looked out and saw that a gleaming carpet of fine powder was springing up everywhere. Well, it can't be helped, said the rat. We must make a start. The worst of it is, I don't exactly know where we are. And now this snow makes everything look so very different. 
and indeed it did. Nevertheless, they set out bravely. An hour or two later, they realized that they were lost. They sat down on a fallen tree trunk to rest. We can't hit, sit here very long, said the rat. The snow will soon be too deep for us to wade through. He peered about and considered. Look here, he went on. There's a dell down there in front of us. Let's make our way down into that and try to find some sort of shelter. So once more, they plodded onward. As they searched for a corner that was dry, the mole tripped and fell forward on his face. Oh, my leg, he cried. Oh, my poor shin. Poor old mole, said the rat kindly. You don't seem to be having much luck today. Let's have a look at that leg. I must have tripped over a hidden branch or a stump, said the mole miserably. It's a very clean cut, said the rat, examining it. It looks as if it was made by a sharp edge of something made of metal. Well, never mind what done it, said the mole, forgetting his grammar in his pain. It hurts just the same, whatever done it. But the rat, after carefully tying up the leg with his handkerchief, was busy scraping in the snow. He scratched and shoveled while the mole waited impatiently. Suddenly the rat cried, Hooray! What have you found, Ratty? asked the mole. Come and see, said the delighted rat. The mole hobbled up to the spot and had a good look. Well, he said at last slowly, I see it right enough, a door scraper. Well, what of it? <laughs> we don't, many of you don't know what a door scraper is, but if you live in the country or on a farm, you might know what a door scraper is. It's a small metal frame located near a front door on which people can scrape the mud off their shoes or boots before entering a house. A door scraper? Well, what of it? But don't you see what it means? cried the rat. Of course I see what it means, replied the mole. It means that some very careless person has left his door scraper lying about in the middle of the wild wood. Oh dear, cried the rat in despair. Here, stop arguing and come and dig. And he set to work again and made the snow fly in all directions. After some further effort, a very shabby doormat lay exposed to view. There, what did I tell you, exclaimed the rat. Absolutely nothing, replied the mole with perfect truthfulness. You seem to have found another piece of domestic litter. Do you mean to say, cried the excited rat, that this doormat doesn't tell you anything? Really, rat, said the mole. Who ever heard of a doormat telling anybody anything? They simply don't do it. Doormats know their place. Now look here, you, you thick-headed beast, replied the rat, really angrily. Keep digging if you want to sleep dry and warm tonight. The rat, using his cudgel, attacked the snowbank with great ferocity. The mole scraped busily, too. Some ten minutes later, the rat's cudgel struck against something that sounded hollow. He called the mole to come and help him. Before long, their efforts were rewarded, for there in the side of a snowbank stood a little door. An iron bell pull hung by the side. Below the bell on a small brass plate were the, where the moonlit words, Mr. Badger. The mole fell backwards in the snow. Rat, he cried, you're a wonder. You knew that if there was a door scraper, there was bound to be a doormat. And if only I had your head, Ratty. But as you haven't, interrupted the rat, I suppose you're going to sit on the snow all night and talk. Get up at once and hang on to that bell pull while I hammer on the door. That's the end of our story. Who have they found? They have found Badger's home. There's the bell pull. It's like a doorbell. It would have gone inside and there would have been a little bell attached to it before there was electricity. So there's the door in the, in the snowbank. Mr. Badger's house. This is the door scraper. And you would have just put your foot on here and scraped it until you got all the med mud off. There's the little wrap on Mole's leg and the doormat. So what season is this chapter in? <laughs> Definitely winter. It's cold and snowy and everybody's wearing their winter clothes. 
When Mole asks Rat to go with him to see Mr. Badger, why do you think that Rat wants to postpone the visit or tells Mole evasively that he doesn't think Mr. Badger is at home? Well, Mr. Badger lives in the wild wood and Rat seems a little uncomfortable about going there. It's also winter, so the weather's bad. He would rather have Mr. Badger come to visit him. What's the setting of this chapter? Remember the setting is two things, where the story takes place and when the story takes place. So it's taking place in, in the wild woods, that's where, and in winter tells you when it's taking place. How would you describe this wild wood? It seems dark, scary. What kinds of things live in there? Well, there are trees in there that sort of grow close together, holes with animals that look at mole with malice. At the beginning of the story, from whose character's perspective is this story being told? Mole, right? The perspective of the beginning of the story was told from Mole's perspective. He was thinking about Badger. He wanted to go visit Badger. He eventually went to, to the wild wood, saw all those wild animals in there, became frightened and hid. All of that is Mole's perspective. Later on, Soon as rat, or excuse me, as soon as mole is hiding, the story begins to be told from rat's perspective. And the rest of this chapter is told through rat's perspective. Being worried about his friend, going to find his friend, wrapping his friend's leg, keeping digging, understanding what the clues in the snow about the scraper and the doormat, and then finally finding the door. So the perspective of our story has changed. Um, how does Rat find Mole? Well, he goes armed with guns into the wild wood and calls for Mole for more than an hour until he hears Mole's feeble answer from that hole in the tree. And how does Rat answer Mole's question about whether or not Toad would go to the wild wood? <laughs> Rat laughs. And then what does he say? Old Toad, he wouldn't show his face here alone for anything. That might give you an idea of how dangerous it actually could be. How do Rat and Mole find Badger's door? Mole stumbles first on the door scraper, and then Rat understands the hint of what that means. Rat finds the doormat, and then they continue to search until they find the door through the snow. That's the end for today.